والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Now, the expedition of Bani Al-Mustalaq or Ma Al-Murayseer is over. The Prophet ﷺ attacked them and they fled their houses leaving the women the children and also lots and lots of herd among those enslaved was the daughter of the leader of that tribe and she was Juwayriyah bint Al-Harith she came to the Prophet والسلام, trying to free herself and in Islam slavery is there and no one can deny it some of the scholars who were affected by the West were taking defensive positions in the sense that whenever the issue of slavery comes they try to defend by saying no no you misunderstand the situation slavery was very limited and uh, on the contrary the Prophet almost forbade slavery and this is not true in Islam slavery is much different than any other religion for example in, in, in other practices before Islam came slavery was so widely spread that it was easy for a person traveling on his own or with his co company to be attacked by tribesmen killing whomever they can and enslaving the living. So if you were walking on, on your own, minding your own business, it's very easy the, the following day that you become a slave yeah. because somebody just came and attacked you. This happened with Salman al-Farsi, as you remember, the seeker of truth, truth. when he uh, uh, migrated from Persia and he went to Iraq, to Sham, and then was enslaved and sold to a Jew in Medina. So this was widely practiced. If you had a debt to someone and you could not repay it, he would enslave you. If you were poor, you could sell your children. And, and this happens in parts of Asia because they're so poor, they sell their children for 20 100 or, or $200. And that's very cheap. Islam came and made all of these practices forbidden. Yet... There was one place or one process for slavery in Islam, and that is fighting in the cause of Allah. In the sense that if we fight non-Muslims, whether they are the oppressors, whether they are preventing Islam from spreading, or whether they are hostile to Islam and Muslims, and we prison, imprison those who are still alive, they become slaves. Any other form is not permissible. Of course, even if they were enslaved and then they reverted to Islam, they are still slaves and their children are still slaves. Now, having said that, Islam permits and recommends you setting slaves free. And as form of, uh, of expiation, there are so many sins and wrongdoings in Islam that when a person does one, 
as form of expiation, he is instructed to free a slave. For example, if you kill someone by mistake, not intentionally, if you're driving a car and you hit someone and he dies, this is by mistake. You give the blood money to his relatives, next of kin, but you also have to fast, have to uh, free a slave. If you cannot find a slave to free, you have to fast two consecutive months. The slave goes to the deceased family? No. Just to... For, to Allah. You don't give the slave to the uh, uh, family of the deceased. You free the slave for Allah. So after being your slave, he becomes a free man uh, uh, to go. Also, if someone makes vihar, and vihar is not a divorce, but it is a form of making something that is permissible, forbidden. So if a husband says to his wife that you are to me like my mother or like my sister. So he made what was lawful for him forbidden because it's forbidden for him to have intimate uh, a relationship with his, wife, with his mother or with his uh, a daughter or sister. So once he utters these words in order for him to go back to normal practice with his wife, he has to free a slave. There are so many things that the Prophet ﷺ tells us that if you do this, free a slave. And there's a beautiful hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever frees a slave for the sake of Allah, with every part and organ of that slave, Allah will free a part or, or, or an organ from you from hellfire. So, if he had two hands and you feed him, Allah will free your hands from hell. So if you free a full uh, slave, Allah Azza wa will free you from hell. So this is extremely important for Muslims because this is what they thrive for, to avoid hellfire and to be permitted into paradise. And that is why lots of the companions used to buy slaves and free them for the sake of Allah the Almighty. One other issue of slavery is that it is permissible for a Muslim male to enjoy a female slave in the sense that it's forbidden for a Muslim to fornicate or to commit adultery. It's forbidden for a Muslim to enjoy sex unless it is with his wife or with his slave female. Now, one would say, this is barbaric. She's a prisoner of war. She's a slave. And he has intercourse with her? Well, first of all, this is the rule of Allah. Second of all, this is for the benefit of that slave. How is that? If the slave got pregnant, automatically she cannot be sold, she cannot be given away, and she cannot be uh, 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 inherited. So, by getting pregnant, she is actually on the process of being free. Of course, she is not completely free until her master sets her free or he dies. So, she, she has some rights, a lot of rights after mm -hmm. she gets pregnant. Again, no. She does not have the rights that a wife does mm -hmm. because she is a slave. And to us, this might sound a little bit strange but then a slave was something that is sold and bought something that is given wives would would buy slaves and give them to their husbands in order to uh, yeah. uh, work at the house and maybe serve her master so this is god given right to muslims this introduction makes us understand the position of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Juwayri ibn al Harith, the daughter of the leader of the tribe of Bani Mustalaq, came to the Prophet She came to him because she wanted to be set free. In Islam, if a person sets his slave free, he or she are free. But if he does not want to set the slave free, the, the slave has the right to agree with his master and buy himself or herself from the master. 
So if my slave comes to me and tells me that I would like to buy myself, I would say, okay, go and work. And whatever you make, let's say, I need, I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy you for 10000 So you go work and get me 10000 1000 per month. After 10 months, free. I have the money, you're free. So this is permissible in Islam. Having said that, remember that the slave and everything that the slave owns belongs to the master. To the master. So even before I allow him to work, whatever he does, it's mine. So it's a form of compromise to the master and to the slave. And there are so many cases in, in the seerah and the sunnah where slaves came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him for help. For example, Barira. May Allah be pleased with her, was a slave. And her husband was named, named uh, was Mughith. And they were both married as slaves. And then Barira went to Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, and requested her help to free herself. So Aisha helped her with the money until she bought herself from her masters and she became free. Once she became free, it was her choice as a free woman to remain with her husband Mughith or to be set free and separated from him. So she chose to separate from him because who would want to be married to a slave? And Mughith loved her so much to the extent that he went to the Prophet ﷺ and requested him to intercede with his ex-wife. So the Prophet went to Barira and he asked her if she would like to reconsider getting back to Mughith. So Barira said, are you instructing me? Is this an order? So the Prophet ﷺ said, no, I'm just interceding. She said, I don't need him and I don't want him. The story sa says and tells us that afterwards, Mughith, may Allah be pleased with him, used to walk behind and after Barira with his tears going down his beard because he loved her so much and he could not go back and she could, would not go back to him. The, the, the catch of the story is that Barira bought herself from her masters. Juwayr ibn al-Harith went to the Prophet والسلام, and as the daughter of the leader of her tribe, she told him that she wanted to buy herself and set herself free. free. Now, what was the answer of the Prophet والسلام, to uh, uh, Juwayriya bint al-Harith. This is inshallah what we will know after the break, so stay tuned. <laughs> So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, each name has a meaning, each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Juwayr ibn al-Harith went to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Being the daughter of the leader of the tribe of Bani al-Mustalaq, she wanted to buy herself because she was enslaved and she wanted to set herself free. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam with his vision saw that this woman cannot be enslaved. She is from a very high ranking in her tribe. And the tribe of Bani al-Mustalaq, as we know, is part of the tribe of Khuza'a. And they were so close to the Prophet ﷺ, though they were not Muslims, but they were allies of Bani Hashim. So they were allies of the father of the Prophet ﷺ and his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. So, the Prophet ﷺ thought that it was not proper for a woman in that prestige 
and uh, to be enslaved. So he told her, Would you like that I set you free and I marry you? And she accepted that. So she reverted to Islam, accepted Islam. She was set free. And the Prophet ﷺ married Juwayriya bint al-Harith, the daughter of al-Harith ibn Abi Dharar, the leader of the tribe of Bani Mustalaq. Now, if the Prophet ﷺ wanted to have this woman as a slave, he could have. There was no need for him to free her and marry her because it's permissible for a man to have as many slaves, female slaves, as he wishes and enjoy them. Yet, the Prophet ﷺ had a vision. And subhanAllah, the blessing of Juwayriya on her people was tremendous. The minute the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, saw the Prophet ﷺ marrying Juwayriya bint al-Harith, they said to themselves, is this acceptable? The Prophet وسلم, is married to Juwayriya, the daughter of the leader of Bani Mustalaq, and we have his in-laws as in slaves, uh, as slaves, our slaves. This is not acceptable. How can this be? So immediately they went to their slaves of the tribe of Bani Mustalaq and set them free because the Prophet's wife was one of them. So she had the blessing over her tribe to the extent that 100 families were set free for his sake. Did she embrace Islam later? Or? No, no, she embraced Islam earlier, earlier. because the Prophet ﷺ could not have married her while she was a polytheist. So after being enslaved, she accepted Islam and then went to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet set her free and married her. So look at the vision of the Prophet ﷺ. Though he married this woman, he could have enjoyed her without marriage. He could have enjoyed her without freeing her. He could have done whatever he wanted without the companions setting their slaves free for her. Yet the Prophet ﷺ wanted to bless this whole tribe and they all, alhamdulillah, reverted to Islam because of this woman, woman because of this marriage. Now, her father, Al-Harith ibn Abi Durar, was not a Muslim. He was a polytheist. So, the story says that a month or two, or maybe more, he came to Medina in peace. And he requested permission to enter Medina, so he entered Medina. And he met the Prophet, ﷺ, and the Prophet called him to Islam, and he was, you know, hesitant, not yes or no. And he requested the Prophet ﷺ to give him back his daughter, thinking that the Prophet ﷺ enslaved her, and now she was under his power and in captivity. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, well, ask her if she wants to go with you. She's free. So Juwayri was present. She greeted her father. Her father told her, come back with me to our tribe. And what would you expect Juwayri to say? No way. This is the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah. How do you want me to leave him? And go back to you, w w with you. And she refused to go with her father. And decided to be with her husband. And this is what every woman should do. If given the choice between her father or her husband, she has to remain with her husband. Because he is her way to paradise. Before being married, her father was her way to paradise. This is part of Islam, to obey your father, and if she's married, to obey, to obey uh, uh, her husband. And likewise, for a male, it is his ob obligation to obey his... God. Well, humans. For, for no, mother. Mother, his mother. 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 So, no women would say, what is this? This is uh, 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 all for the man's side. A woman must obey her father, then her husband, then so on. Well, it's the same thing with the man. He has to obey his mother. And that before is why... Excuse me? His mother before his father. Well, this is a, a controversial issue. 
he has to obey both. And that is why Malik ibn Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, uh, the leader and the head of the Maliki school of thought. When someone came to him and told him that my father tells me something and my mother tells me another thing that is completely opposite, who should I obey? So he told him, obey your father and do not disobey your mother. So wh okay. what do you want me to do? This is a very diplomatic answer that tells him do not disobey any of them. Try to reconcile, try to have something compromise, do something in between. But you cannot disobey any of them as long as they're not asking you to do something that was forbidden. Now, after that, Al-Harith ibn Abi Darar himself, Alhamdulillah, accepted Islam. And it was the custom of the Prophet ﷺ that when a dignitary or a leader of his tribe accepts Islam, that he makes him the leader of the Muslims at that area. So he kept him as the leader of his tribe and he made him collect the charity and the alms do, uh, the poor do the zakah from his people and from the tribes next to him. After Banal Mustalaq was over, the military detachments kept on going. But this time they were headed in different directions to the east of Arabia, to the center of Arabia, and also to the north. And among the first was the detachments of Abdurrahman ibn Auf. May Allah be pleased with him. The Prophet ﷺ sent him to the, uh, uh, the village or the area of Bani, Bani, Bani Kalb, uh, and it was close to Dawmat al-Jindal. And he told him that, call them to Islam. If they accept Islam, then marry the daughter of their king. And Abdurrahman went there, he preached them about Islam, they liked Islam, they accepted it, Alhamdulillah, and he married Tamadr bint al-Asbagh, the daughter of their leader, their king, he was a king. And he stayed there for three days, and Alhamdulillah went back to Medina. Also the Prophet والسلام, sent Ali ibn Abi Talib to the land of Sa'd ibn, ibn Bakr, and he went there, they were dispersed uh, all around their village and, and their, their place. They could not fight. And alhamdulillah, he gathered 500 camels and 2,000 sheep and took them back to Medina. Um, Sariya, another detachment of Abu Bakr, and some say it was of Zayd ibn Haritha to Wadi al-Qira or al-Qura, and also... Alhamdulillah, it was uh, uh, successful. Then came a group of men. Some say six, some say seven, and others say eight. They came from the tribes of Uql and Urayna. And they are well known as the story of the Uraniyin, the people from Urayna. They came to the Prophet ﷺ, claiming to be, accept Islam. And as we know that Medina had something in it that made people feel, uh, uh, fall sick the minute they go to Medina. It's sort of a fever because of its dry air and of, of, of its uh, uh, nature being surrounded by volcanic mountains and so on. And when the Prophet ﷺ first migrated to Medina, Abu Bakr, Bilal, among other companions fell ill and they had the fever. And they hallucinated. So the Prophet ﷺ prayed to Allah to take this fever to Al-Juhfa. And as we know, Al-Juhfa is a place that is about 250 uh, kilometers west-south of Medina. And it is a miqat where people come and uh, uh, establish their ihram when they're performing umrah or performing hajj if they're coming from the north or from the west of Mecca. So Allah Azza wa Jal answered his prayer and it was moved there. And soon after, the, uh, 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 the, the village turned into a ghost town. The people fled that village and they went to other areas. When these men came to Medina from Uql and Urayna, they fell sick and they were actually very poor. 
and very thin because of uh, uh, starving and hunger. They went to the Prophet ﷺ and told him that we would like your help and aid because we are sick. So he told them to go out of Medina where, they, where the Prophet ﷺ had all the camels that were given as sadaqah. And these camels, they used to milk and drink from its milk. And it, and it is well known fact that the milk of camels uh, cure a lot of diseases. So these men went to the camels and they sat there for a while until they were back and healthy. Not thanking the blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal, not having any type of gratitude to the Prophet Sallallahu who was kind to them. After being well and strong, they went to the shepherd or the keeper of these camels and they killed him. Before they killed him, they tortured him. And in some narrations, it was reported that they uh, uh, set fire on nails and then they put these nails round his eyes until the, his eyes were uh, uh, gone. And then they chopped his hands and legs and killed him. This was a grave and serious offense. What was the reaction of the Prophet ﷺ to that? This is inshallah what we will discuss next time we meet. Until then, في أمان الله والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Mm-hmm.